Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome to Sunday School, a weekly segment of the Pat Flynn Show, where we talk all things faith, spirituality, and religion. Folks, this is episode number two, and I couldn't be more excited about this. I was extremely energized by the response that we got from the initial episode. People are hungry for this stuff. They want to hear about it. They want to talk about it, and that's exactly what we are going to do. And it it pumps me up because I've long maintained that when it comes to being a good generalist, that means when it comes to really getting the most out of life, we want to get good to great at many different things. Uh, And we want to pursue the good. And there are so many good things in life. But there is only one ultimate good. And um, Aquinas really helped to explain this to us. But Augustine really understood it as well when he said, You made us for yourselves, O Lord, and so our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. And how beautifully stated that is, and how important it is to remember that all these other things in life that are good, that are worth pursuing and engaging in, whether that's fitness, or writing, or business, or martial arts, or enjoying the outdoors, or or whatever you are interested in, whatever you want to get better at, they are all good to the extent that you have that ultimate orientation to the final good, that you have that spiritual and religious foundation. Uh, And by having that spiritual and religious foundation, by having that proper orientation toward the ultimate good, which is God, all the other goods are enhanced by that. Everything else becomes so much better. Um, You know, this was a mistake that I made in my atheist days. I thought if I could just get better at certain things, if I could just make more money or or be more fit or write more books or become more popular, that that would help me to find happiness and many things. And I did accomplish many things, but it it didn't give me that perfect happiness. In, In many instances, it actually made me actively miserable because I didn't have the right orientation. It wasn't until that I finally came all the way back around and rediscovered my faith that all these other areas that I, that I that I was and still am deeply interested in that I love to develop and share with other people everything from again from fitness business writing uh, philosophy um, you name it whatever it is um, all these things have been greatly enhanced to the extent that I can engage in them and enjoy them because they are genuine, genuinely good activities that are on the way to the ultimate good, but are not, none of them are or ever could be the ultimate good in itself. Um, so I, I, I just wanted to offer that is, a, is none of them are or ever could be the ultimate good in itself. Um, so I, I, I just wanted to offer that is, a, is an introduction to this episode because we're going to talk about how to think about God. That sounds interesting, doesn't it? We're going to talk about how to think about God. And wh- why are we going to do this? Well, a few reasons. I think it's really important to think about God from a philosophical perspective and not just from the standpoint of revelation. And and there's a few reasons for this. One is it was the study of philosophy that that brought me back to faith. It was understanding the arguments for God's existence and moving through the the use of reason and deduction to discern who or what or exactly what God is like that re- the Christian message that ultimately led me to believe that that Christianity was true. So I want to share a very classic argument for the existence of God. This argument is known commonly as the argument from contingency. It, it goes at least back to Aquinas um, from his argument um, from necessity, from possibility and necessity. But more commonly, it's attributed to Wilhelm Gottfried Leibniz. Um, but I'm not even going to use his version. The version that I'm going to to talk you through today uh, comes from what I think is just a, a wonderful book by a, a more contemporary philosopher, 
Uh, Mortimer J. Adler. Mortimer J. Adler was just such a profound thinker, and he's got a great story himself. But he he wrote the book uh, How to Read a Book, which I constantly recommend. If you're interested in learning how to learn, uh, in learning how to get the most out of out of the most out of out of reading, of going from a state of understanding less to understanding more, you have to read How to Read a Book. But he was also um, an incredible philosopher. He, he was a philosopher of mind. Um, a philosopher of religion, and in, in in his book, How to Think About God, which I'm, I'm bor- borrowing for the title of this episode, he takes us through his version of the argument from contingency, which he calls a truly cosmological argument. Now, cosmological arguments typically work around the idea that the universe itself, its sheer existence, can be used in some capacity um, – to get to God as the ultimate soul reality. And there's many different versions of, of cosmological arguments, and hopefully we'll get time to explore them all uh, as we continue on with Sunday School. Uh, but this version, I think, is particularly compelling. Um, it's a, it, this argument has stood the test of time. Um, it, is, it, it is too complex. I think it's pretty accessible. We're, we're going to spend some time on it so I can help you understand it, and there's two reasons this is important. First, understanding arguments um, like the argument from contingency will help deepen your strength and, and, and your conviction um, in, in the God of Christianity, um, if you need that. Uh, because a lot of times people, you know, the, the common assertion from non-believers is, show me the evidence. You know, what good reasons do we have to believe in God? There's no good reasons to, to believe in God. And anybody who's ever said that has just never looked for those reasons. There's, there is is a preponderance of evidence. There is a preponderance of good reasons to believe in the existence of God, and we're going to give just one in this episode. So it's helpful for that. It's helpful for yourself. It also helps to uh, helps us to learn uh, about some of God's attributes. It helps us to get at monotheism. A lot of these arguments, these philosophical arguments, like the argument from contingency, gets us to what's called the verse meaning the God that, mo- that philosophers can get to through reason alone. What can we know about God through reason alone? And there are certain attributes, attributes that we can arrive at, uh, such as immaterial, timeless, changeless, extremely powerful, possessed of intellect and will, and so on. Now, it's important to note that the God of the philosophers does not necessarily get you the God of Christianity, but it sets the grounds and it narrows the scope from which you can then move toward the God of Christianity. You can build a cumulative case. So, for example, by getting to the God of the philosophers, by using reason alone, you can arrive at monotheism, right? Again, a a transcendent being that is absolutely simple. Um, And from there, you can kind of look at, okay, well, what are all the major religions that subscribe to monotheism? Well, there's, there's three big ones, right? Judaism... Christianity and Islam. And I really like presenting a cumulative case in apologetics work and evangelization for Christianity, where first we, we work the, the, the angles of, of reason and philosophy. We establish that God certainly more probably exists than not. And then, well, what, what can reason and philosophy tell us about this God? And that will get us to monotheism. And then we can start to weigh the historical evidence for Jesus Christ. Because if you, if, you, if you have a reasonable basis for belief in God, then you have that, that just opens up um, the case for Christ, if you will. Uh, you know, a lot of times when I was an atheist, I never paid attention to, to Jesus or, or any arguments for Jesus because I didn't even believe in God. So I just figured that the resurrection was just a hoax or something like that. But once you remove that prejudice against the supernatural, well, then the Jesus question becomes a lot more interesting. And, and I'll refer people to the episode I did on mere Christianity where I roll. Well, then the Jesus question becomes a lot more interesting. And, and I'll refer people to the episode I did on mere Christianity where I, I weighed the historical evidence for Jesus, and uh, made the case that the only explanation that explains the facts that need to be explained is, of course, the resurrection. And that's where these two worlds meet, where the God of the philosophers can lead you to the God of Christianity when you when you use both reason and philosophy and then look at the historical evidence uh, for the resurrection. And then what you can do is you can complete your picture of God through revelation, right? So once you have good reason to believe in revelation, 
right? Once you've gotten to monotheism and, and you and you accept the resurrection, well, then we can learn a lot about God um, through what Jesus taught us about God. Uh, so, for example, you know, we can get to monotheism through reason alone, but we can't get to the Trinity. The Trinity was revealed to us, the reasonably, reasonably believe in through this cumulative apologetic case. So I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I just I just want to show you how these things add up, um, and and how it is this. And I'm I'm kind of following my own reconversion path here th- that I took that I've outlined uh, elsewhere, um, and it was so helpful to me. And I want to be able to provide that path for other people who may have had similar holdups or confusions that that I had. But without further ado, let's start to dive into this argument. So again, I'm I'm going to kind of talk you through. Uh, Mortimer J. Adler's truly cosmological argument. So the form of this argument will be a little bit different than the version that Leibniz gives, uh, but it's essentially the same argument. Um, I just like the way that Adler presents it. I think it's quite accessible, fairly simple, um, and when it comes to arguments like these, Kalam, when it comes to apologetic work when it comes to evangelization, we do want to try to keep arguments as simple as possible. Um, for me, that's things like the Kalam cosmological argument, the argument from contingency, um, because some arguments can be very convincing, almost outright compelling, but they take a lot of explanation. Here I think of like Aquinas's first way or, or Aristotle's unmoved mover argument. And to, to get through an argument like that, you need to, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be defined, like um, accidental versus hierarchical series, actuality and potenti- potentiality, and there's just there's just you know there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Now, once you do that work, you'll you'll figure, wow, this is an an absolutely fantastic argument for the existence of God, and it tells us a lot about God. But if you're just trying to you know have a conversation with somebody really quickly and, and try and get them to see that there's good reasons to believe in God. You might want to keep the arguments as simple as possible at first, and then once you've once you've got their interest and their interest and they're a little bit more receptive, then you can trot out the more complex but perhaps more compelling arguments. That said, I'm not saying that the contingency argument isn't compelling. I personally think it's a fantastic argument. It's one of the arguments that really started to shift me, and that's why I want to share it with you now. All right. So it's important to, to – let's get a little background on this argument. The whole idea of this argument is, is to show that the universe doesn't explain itself. Nothing about the universe is necessary, we would say. Um, there's, and the famous question that Leibniz asked, he said the most exquisite question that any person can ask is why is there something rather than nothing, right? And, and, and this is the question that demands an answer. Uh, and so when we think of the universe, we think okay, that it is radically contingent. There is nothing in the universe that necessarily explains itself because – and I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves here, but we can imagine that the universe could have been quite different, that it could – we can imagine that the universe could have been quite different, that it could have been governed by different laws, that there could have been – it could have been made of different stuff. Uh, again, there's nothing necessary about it. Or, even more radically, we could imagine that the universe simply doesn't exist at all. So ultimately what the argument is driving towards is that the universe must be grounded here and now in some type of ultimate soul necessary reality. Uh, For the universe to exist here and now, and I'm going to keep repeating the terms here and now. It's so important to this argument. This is not a temporal argument. This isn't a first cause argument in the sense that God brought the universe into being um, you know, 13.7 billion years ago or whatever. There are arguments for that, but that isn't this argument. This argument is saying that God actually preserves the universe in being. He is the great ex annihilator of the universe. So that's the gist of it. But we can examine it a little bit more carefully. And, and Now, it's important in, in argumentation that we make the premises as strong as possible, that we want, we want the, the stake of denying the premises to be so high that to do so would make you appear intellectually absurd, right? Now, we can't ever prove anything with, with absolute certainty, typically, like a, like a geometrical equation when we're presenting arguments like this. But we can make the argument more plausibly true than not. I would say extremely so. And I think this argument does exactly that. So what I want to do is walk you through 
the steps of this argument as Adler presents them and just offer some explanation along the way to, to help you understand it, okay? So the first premise, and I'm just going gonna, gonna to quote here, says this. Um, it's going to seem a little technical, and then I'll, I'll see what I can do to simplify it. Number one, premise one, the existence of an effect requiring the concurrent existence and action requiring the concurrent existence and action of an efficient cause implies the existence and action of that cause the causal principle thus stated is self-evidently true as has been said before okay what the heck does he mean by that let me have a sip of my coffee before i try to even explain that okay so he says the existence of an effect requiring the concurrent existence and action of an efficient cause implies the existence and action of that cause. So what he is essentially saying here is something very similar to the original premise of Leibniz's famous argument, which is that everything that exists has an explanation for its existence either in an external cause or a necessity of its own being. Now he's saying it a little bit, Adler's saying it a little bit differently. He's saying for something to exist, there must also exist something that explains this. There must also exist something that explains that thing's existence. Okay? Uh, and that these these things are inseparable. It's not going back in time. It's not to say that I exist because my parents gave birth to me and now I'm independent of my parents. That would be a temporal argument. This one is looking at what preserves something in being here and now. For something to exist here and now, there must be an explanation for why it exists here and now, independent of whatever may have brought it into being at a certain point in time. So again, this could be more simply stated as anything that exists has an explanation for its existence, either in an external cause or a necessity of its own being. That's premise one. Now, to deny that argument would uh, land you in a tangle of absurdities, uh, I think. But we can come we can come back to that. Um, but let's just be honest here. I mean, this 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 is not only self evidently true. Uh, when we look, we search for explanations for pretty much everything. That's that's largely what philosophy and science is about. And as it turns out, when we look for explanations, we typically find them. The universe is intelligible. Um, there are reasons for why things exist. Um, so this, I would certainly like to present that this premise is far more plausibly true than not. Uh, and to deny it would require a severe uh, level of skepticism. Um, so we'll, we'll perhaps come back to this, but let's move, let's move through the argument and then we'll break it down a little bit more. So premise number two, the cosmos as a whole exists. Uh, and he goes on to say, here we have the existential assertion that is indispensable as a premise in any existential inference, while it does not have the same certitude possessed by my assertion of my own existence, it can certainly be affirmed beyond a reasonable doubt. So it out loud, I'm like, okay, he's actually kind of technical in his language here. What he's saying is it's obvious the universe exists, right? And if you're going to deny it, um, I don't know how we're going to have any kind of serious conversation after that point. He said it might not be quite as obvious as my own existence, right? I think, therefore, I am. Um, like if there's one thing that we cannot deny, it's that we exist, that there is some one, some consciousness that is experiencing something. Now, you could say that there's no way you can prove the universe exists. You could be a brain in a vat, as philosophers sometimes like to frighten students with at the, at the, at the first time they come into a philosophy class. But there's good reasons to reject that. Uh, and any reasonable person would, of course, affirm that the cosmos as a whole, the universe as a whole, the reality of the external world is, in fact, a reality. It exists. That's what he's saying in number two. Okay, now premise number three. This is the important one: the existence of the cosmos. Okay, now premise number three. This is the important one: the existence of the cosmos as a whole is radically contingent, which is to say, while not needing an efficient cause of its coming into being, it nevertheless does need an efficient cause of its continuing existence to preserve it in being and prevent it from being replaced by nothingness. So this is really important to get this one right. So what Adler is saying is that the universe does not explain itself. And even if we don't need an explanation 
for the beginning of the universe. So for this argument, he grants the strongest premise uh, to somebody who might be p- p- uh, an opponent to the existence of God, which is saying even if we assume that the universe is eternal, even if we assume that the universe did not have a beginning, uh, which he later says that most most cosmologists believe that it did have an absolute beginning, but he's saying that's not – important even grant you that even if the universe was everlasting, even if it never came into being, we still need an explanation for why it continues to exist for something that preserves it in being rather than being replaced by nothingness. So this is this is premise number three. It says it is radically contingent. It does not explain itself. It it demands an explanation that is beyond itself. Okay? And then what follows uh, would be his conclusion. If the, comma, if the cosmos needs an efficient cause of its continuing existence to prevent its annihilation, to stop it from going out of being, then that cause must be a supernatural being, supernatural in its action, and one the existence of which is uncaused. In other words, the supreme being or God. So he's saying if the, if the universe is entirely contingent, if nothing about matter, space, time, or energy explains itself, then the only thing that could explain it is something that is beyond it. Meaning there must, in principle, be some type of explanation for the existence of the timeless, uh, for the existence of the universe. But to explain the universe would put you outside of the universe, implying that you are supernatural, timeless, spaceless, so extremely powerful, and possessed of intellect and will. Uh, How do we know it's possessed of intellect and will? Well, the only other type of thing that could be timeless, spaceless, would be something like an abstract object, like a number. But numbers can't create anything, right? So it has to be some type of immaterial mind or supreme being, as he says, God, okay? So it's important to understand that the the argument here is logically valid. And what that means is if the premises are true, then the conclusion follows whether one likes it or not. This is a deductive argument. So if if you want to try and escape the conclusion, you have to challenge one of the premises. So the the only really question is, are are the premises true? And, well, let's let's talk about it, right? Um... So I, I just want to reiterate one more time that this – because this is such a, common, such a common mistake. When it comes to the argument from contingency and especially when it comes to the arguments that Aquinas made, so many people make the mistake of thinking that they're talking about causes in an accidental series, meaning something happened X number of years ago and it set the whole ball rolling. Um, but that isn't the argument that they're making. Uh, Aquinas, Adler, Leibniz, they didn't make that argument. The argument that they make actually grants the premise that the universe could be eternal. The the, the famous example that, that Leibniz gives is that you could have um, uh, an infinite series of geometry textbooks, okay? And we could say that it's just one textbook was photocopied by another textbook backwards in for affinity and forward into affinity. So we can we can show how the textbooks got there. Uh, in a temporal sense, they've just been photocopied for all of eternity, right? Forward and backwards in time. But that doesn't explain why the textbooks are there to begin with. Who wrote the textbooks? Why are they geometry textbooks? Um, these things demand an explanation. So just because you could explain something in, in a temporal sense of how one physical state led to another physical state, right? You have done nothing to explain the existence of those physical states as a whole. They are still radically contingent. So even if you grant the premise that the universe is eternal, you have still not sufficiently explained why there is something rather than nothing. You would need to show that that eternal series of something explains itself, which Adler is saying, which Leibniz has said, and which Aquinas has said, absolutely, it does not. There's nothing about the universe which explains itself, okay? So I I keep reiterating those points because it's just every time I I, I talk about this argument with people. They, they always get mixed up on that, so it's it's worth reiterating. Um, so now, of course, uh, possibly um, Aquinas himself, I think, would be delighted by the state of modern Big Bang cosmology, um, but that's simply irrelevant. Um, so why don't we start with what I believe is the only possibly contentious premise in this in this argument, and I'll, I'll read how um, Adler reinforces the premise and uh, a little bit from his from his book and that would be premise number three okay so let me um let me pull it up here 
and we'll we'll kind of walk through, read through Adler's reasoning and see if we agree with him, okay? All right, let's see. Um, do, do, do. All right, so it seems that the only contentious premise is number three, potentially. And if, if, if we can nail down premise three, we pretty much – we got this argument, right? It's absolutely more plausibly true than not. So premise three uh, asserts that the universe as a whole is radically contingent, that it does not explain itself. So let me place Adler's response to this, and I'll explain it as best as I can as we move along. All right, so – is it possible for the cosmos that now exists to cease to exist and replace nothing at all? That, that is really the question that, that is at hand because if that question is yes, then we can very strongly confirm that the universe is in fact contingent, that it needs an explanation. So I'll say it one more time. Is it possible for the cosmos that now exists to cease to exist and be replaced by nothing at all? Now, for people who subscribe to, to – uh, the consensus of Big Bang cosmology that the universe had an absolute beginning, that it seems like it didn't exist before a certain point. This seems very obvious. But let's again grant the premise that it's eternal. Okay? So Adler offers a brief explanation of what would be required to show that this is true. And I quote, The contingency of the cosmos as a whole, if it is contingent, must, as we have seen, be radically contingent, perficially contingent, whereas the contingency of individual things is superficial, not radical. Hence, we cannot infer the contingency of the cosmos as a whole from the contingency of its parts, even if all the parts, including electrons and protons, were contingent in their existence, as indicated by the coming into existence and passing away. So really, he's saying don't make the the composition fallacy here. Don't think that just because some things come into being and pass away in a very superficial sense, the parts... Uh, within the whole, that isn't enough to say that the universe as an absolute whole is contingent. So he's 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 smart there. That is uh, a common trap, that uh, fallacy that, that people can fall into when making this argument. So he's just kind of hedging against that a little bit. He's like, we have to show that the universe, the entire cosmos, everything in it is radically contingent, not just that some things are born and die. Say that That isn't enough to advance this argument, and I agree with him. I hope I would agree with him since I'm trying to advance his argument. I hope I would agree with him since I'm trying to advance his argument. Um, so he's not letting us get away with poor reasoning. Very good. So Adler then continues and, and even raises the stakes against his argument. And this is when you know you're working with a good philosopher. Aquinas always did this too. They, they always want to do the opposite of a straw man. They always want to present the, the strongest possible objections and then refute those objections. So Adler says, Should we be unable to affirm the radical contingency of the cosmos – we, sh we would then have no grounds for thinking that the cosmos as a whole needs a supernatural cause to maintain it in existence, complying with Occam's rule, governing inferences to the existence of unobservable hy hypothetical entities. We would not be justified in positing the existence of God to explain the continuing existence of a radically contingent cosmos. So what he's saying here is if the universe really does explain itself, then we don't need God as an explanation. That would violate Occam's razor. We're on the same page. If the universe isn't contingent, then we certainly don't need an explanation. If it explains itself, you don't need an external cause. Great, All right? So said another way, you don't need God to explain a universe that explains itself. Um, <laughs> maybe I should have just <laughs> put this in simpler language, but uh, Adler is very thorough. He's very precise, even if it's a little technical sometimes. So it's still worth working through his version of the argument. Uh, so the question still remains, does the universe explain itself? Well, let's see. Um, Adler goes on to explain why we should view the universe as radically contingent. And he says, and I quote, that reason is to be found in the fact that the cosmos which now exists is only one of many possible universes that might have existed in the infinite past and that might still exist in the infinite future. This is not to say that any cosmos other than the one that is ever did exist in the past or ever will exist in the future. It is not possible to exist in the future. It is not necessary to go that far in order to say that the other universes might have existed in the past or might exist in the future. If other universes are possible, then this one also is merely possible, not necessary. Not the only cosmos that can ever exist in an infinite extent of time. How do we know that the present universe is only a possible universe, one of many possibilities that might exist, and not a necessary universe, the only one that ever can exist? 
Adler continues, We can infer it from the fact that the arrangement and disarray, the order and disorder of the present cosmos, might have been otherwise, might have been different from what it is. There is no compelling reason to think that the natural laws which govern the present cosmos are the only possible natural laws. The cosmos as we know it manifests chance and random happenings as well as lawful behavior. Eve chance and random happenings as well as lawful behavior. Even the electrons and protons, which are thought to be imperishable once they exist, as the building blocks of the present cosmos might not be the building blocks of a different cosmos. The next step in the argument is a crucial one. It consists in saying that whatever might have been otherwise in shape or structure is something that might also not exist at all. That which cannot be otherwise also cannot not exist. And, conversely, what necessarily exists cannot be otherwise than it is. The truth that is the thin thread on which the cosmological argument hangs runs parallel to the truth just stated. Whatever can be otherwise than it is can also simply not be at all. A cosmos which can be otherwise is one that also cannot not be. And conversely, a cosmos that is capable of not existing at all is one to the conclusion that the cosmos, radically contingent in its existence, would not exist at all were its existence not caused. Quite a mouthful there by Professor Adler. Um, but but I, think it's, I think it is quite well explained. I'll, I'll try to um, embellish it a little bit or maybe draw out a few of the nuances, but, it, but he's really saying a very simple and somewhat obvious thing. He said, we can imagine possible worlds that do not look like our possible world. We can imagine universes that are governed by different laws, that have different stuff in it. Maybe it's not protons or, or neutrons. Uh, maybe there's different planets. There's different types of species. Maybe there's no species at all. Maybe there's no matter at all. Maybe there's no time at all. Maybe there is nothing at all. And he says, by this mere possibility that something could be otherwise than it is, it necessarily follows that it, that it could be also no that something could be otherwise than it is. It necessarily follows that it, that it could be also nothing at all and therefore demonstrative of the fact that the universe does not explain itself. It is not necessary. It is subject to radical contingency and demands an explanation beyond itself. And that explanation must be something that is necessary because you cannot have an infinite regress of contingent causes because that wouldn't sufficiently explain anything. There must, in principle, be some type of cause that is itself uncaused, that has an explanation in the necessity of its own being. And so Adler, from another angle, confirms the famous premise once presented by Leibniz that everything which exists has an explanation for its existence, either in a necessity of its own being, like God, or an external cause. The universe exists, the universe does not explain itself, Therefore, the universe has an external cause. And from there, we can unpack what such an external cause would be, which Adler has already helped us figure out. Supernatural, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, extremely powerful, and possessed of intellect uh, and will. And so we've arrived, I think, finally at the god of the philosophers, an entity reached many times by thinkers spanning through various cultures and times and religious backgrounds, from Aristotle to Aquinas, Leibniz, Lonergan, Adler, and so on. Now, personally, I find this argument to be extremely convincing. It's not only stood the test of time, but is as valid and effervescent as ever. Um, I just want to reiterate that, that this argument does not necessarily, again, confirm the god of Christianity. What it does is it shows that atheism is false and that something and that monotheism is true. And once you have that through reason alone, you can then pursue the hunt for truth. You can then weigh all the other evidence. You can then look at the historical case for Jesus. Um, so I, I just I just want to say one more time how important it is to to build that cumulative case for apologetics, for understanding, for evangelization, to to deepen your faith. Now, I know that this argument was, was somewhat a little bit technical, but I, I hope that it's, it's if I'm, if I'm going to simplify it, right, ultimately what it's saying is that for anything to exist here now, 
for us to exist here now. There must be something that's stopping us from going out of existence. God is the ex nihilator of the universe. He is the ultimate soul reality, necessary, unchanging, and eternal. Uh, and it was it was his choice to bring us into existence and sustain us in existence. And boy, if that doesn't make you think a little bit like heretically contingent. Um, and and I think a lot of us have this experience. We have these sort of I don't I don't want to call it a peak experience, but we have these times where we're just kind of looking out at the world or, or we're thinking, and we just and we just get this overwhelming sense of of like wonder like why are we here why does any any of this exist at all because it doesn't seem on its face like there's any good explanation of why it should exist at all and that is of course what Leibniz said is the most exquisite question that any person can ever ask why does the universe exist at all so don't listen to anybody who says that these why questions aren't important that these philosophical questions are important they are the most important questions that you can ask in life because think of this what would be uh the greatest tragedy in life uh the greatest tragedy and the reason i bring this up is because sometimes you'll hear people people who subscribe to scientism right scientism right science is the religion they think the only knowledge is the knowledge that can be empirically discovered and verified the joke about that is is the whole notion is a philosophical one, not a scientific one, and scientifically it's self refuting. Um, you, you can't say that sci- you can't scientifically say that the only things worth knowing are things that are discovered through the scientific process. There's no way to empirically verify that. It's a philosophical assumption, and it's a really bad one. But sometimes people in that camp will say, "Oh, it's not about why; it's about how." Uh, and here they're just, you know, they're interested in how one physical change can can lead to the state of other physical changes, or how one physical state can lead to another physical state. And that's all really well and good, and we want to study that, and we want to know it, but we don't want to restrict ourselves to that. We want to ask those deep why questions, these contingency type questions, because the greatest tragedy in life would be that you think, for whatever reason, that you're above these why questions that you think they're silly questions and then and then what pose there is uh, a, a, an answer to this why question like we've just discussed right suppose there is a meaning to your life to life in general and then suppose that you missed it because you were just unwilling to consider these questions that to me would be the greatest tragedy in life and there's really no excuse not to study these questions they're the best questions they're the types of questions children ask Children ask the best questions. Children make the best philosophers because they ask why so much. Why, 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 why? And good philosophers are people who just take these questions that children ask and think think as deeply as you can upon them. And it's always a both and. Uh, it's, it's, yes, we want to study the how. Of course we do. Of course we want the science. The science is great. It, it helps us. But we don't want to, we don't want to, cross streams in an unproductive way uh, we don't want to we don't want to mistake empirical investigation for philosophical investigation we don't want to think that science philosophy presupposes science science can't get off the ground unless you have basic philosophical assumptions logical beliefs etc um, so I, I'm not going to continue on this rant for too much longer but th- to me Leibniz was dead right when he said this is the most exquisite question a person can ask. Why is there something rather than nothing? So I will invite you to study the argument from contingency. Hopefully I've given you a good start. Obviously we don't have time. Full books uh, and and courses could be written and taught on this this one very argument. You can come at it from so many different angles. I think Adler's book is a really good place to start, How to Think About God. Um... He's got he's got a ton of great books. Um, How to read a book is a great one. Ten philosophical mistakes is another great one, and of course this one as well. Um, so this one, and of course this one as well. Um, so this episode will go up with a corresponding blog post where I have the the segment of the book where he outlines this this argument, so you can kind of follow along there or, or go back and revisit it again. And uh, you know, I'd I'd love to know what you think. I, I wanted to. I know this argument can be a little bit technical, especially if you're new, um, if you're new to philosophy, if you're new to this 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 line of thinking. Um, but it's a good challenge. It's it's accessible with just a little bit of study. 
And I think it's, uh, again, I think it's a great argument. I think it's really compelling. So we'll continue it. Uh, we'll, we'll unpack this argument more over time. It's, it's one that's worth revisiting from many different angles. But I just wanted to trot out uh, the, you know, the, the gist of it, so to speak. So let me know what you think. Um, there's so many good arguments for the existence of God. Um, again, uh, anybody who says that there's no good God, um, again, uh, anybody who says that there's no good reasons or arguments or evidence, they just haven't taken the time to look. Send them this episode. Pass it along. Be like, hey, Pat Flynn thinks there are good reasons and arguments for the existence of God. So you can send them my way. We'll take care of them for you. All right, my friends. Thank you for tuning into Sunday School. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, again, not not every episode we do is going to be heavy on the philosophy. This is this you know we're going to explore faith, deep in faith, spread faith through many different angles. Philosophy. We're going to talk theology. We're going to get down on you know on on the practical level too of how does this really apply to life? Dealing with the tough times, the virtues. Uh, I want to talk a lot about the virtues, so this will be a very generalist show in itself, uh, but I do want to provide those rational grounds, those apologetic grounds, so that way you have full confidence and reason in both defending and presenting your faith to others. So thanks for tuning in. If you get something out of it, talk more about faith. Um, the evangelization is so important, getting the word out to other people. So if you think we're doing a good job of that here, please head over to iTunes, rank the Pat Flynn Show, help spread the word, help me spread the word. We'll keep doing the good work, I promise you. All right, folks. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.